Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Sarah Allspaugh, and I will be your webinar host coming to you from Cincinnati, Ohio, here in the U.S. I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, our topic, Toward in Silico Clinical Trials, Evaluating Medical Device Performance via CFD on Virtual Patients. And I would like to welcome and introduce our speakers today. We have Javier Garez, Julian Dex, and Aaron Godfrey with us. I'll just tell you a little bit about them from their bios, and then I will turn things over to them. A little bit about Javier. In over 20 years of working in high technology and related fields, Javier has held roles in aerospace research, software development, medical device development, technical training, sales, and product management. Javier joined Siemens in 2016 and has been serving as marketing manager for the SimCenter Energy and Medical Device Campaigns in the Simulation and Test Solutions business segment. Javier holds a Bachelor and Master of Science degrees in Aerospace Engineering with an emphasis on computational fluid dynamics from the University of Alabama. Javier is product manager for Virtual Patient Solutions I'm sorry, Julian. <laughs> Forgive me, I got ahead of myself. Julian is product manager for Virtual Patient Solutions. Julian first worked as a junior research engineer at former materialized subsidiary Mobilife, which developed, among other products, AMACE, the 3D printed patient specific hip implant. He then led the Adam Services team from 2011 to 2018 providing virtual patient analysis and 3D printing services to companies worldwide. Julian holds an MSc in biomedical engineering. And finally, we also have Aaron with us today. Aaron works for the Siemens Industry Software as a design exploration technical specialist. His previous experience includes customer support and development. He has worked extensively with industry experts to apply optimization and design of experiments to complex design challenges requiring CFD. He also has a Bachelor's of Science in bio, bio, Biological Engineering and a Master's of Science in Mechanical Engineering. All right, we're excited to have all three of you here today. Javier, I believe you are up first, so give me one second. I will pass you the ball and make you presenter. Thank you, Sarah, and thanks to all of you who are joining us today on this webinar. We very much appreciate your time. We're delighted to have Julian Dex from Materialize with us today to discuss the development of virtual patients and the role that they play in digital clinical trials, or as they're called, in silico trials. So we'll start with a definition. What is meant by in silico trials? Well, just as traditional clinical trials are meant to generate objective evidence of the safety and effectiveness of medical devices, in silico trials are meant to generate digital evidence of safety and effectiveness of a device. Digital evidence generated by computer simulations or more broadly modeling and simulation to augment traditional methods of testing. Now the promise of this approach is, is quite significant for many reasons. For one, we all know that clinical trials are expensive and, and they take time. So generating digital evidence has the potential to reduce both the time and the cost of traditional clinical trials so that ultimately new devices and innovative treatments get to patients more quickly than they otherwise would. Now, generating this kind of evidence relies on a number of things, primarily the ability to accurately model the physics relevant to a particular device and modeling the device in the environment in which it will be used. And, and these are the two things we'll be talking about in today's webinar, high fidelity simulations and high fidelity virtual patients. Now, the goal, as illustrated in, in this diagram from the MDIC website, is to change the proportion of testing that is performed on humans and even animals so that more of it is performed on computers via simulation and on virtual patients. That is offloading animal and human trials to their digital counterparts or to their, to their digital twins, as it were. Now, from a regulatory perspective, the US Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, is, is roundly supportive of the idea of using simulation to generate digital evidence of safety and effectiveness as evidenced by the fact that computational modeling is among their regulatory science priorities and actually has been for a number of years. 
computational modeling to support regulatory decision making. And Siemens has been involved with the agency for, for a number of years in, in initiatives related to this. In fact, the term digital evidence generation was coined during a meeting between Siemens and the FDA back in October 2017 to describe the process of using computer simulations to generate the data required for regulatory reporting and regulatory decision making. Siemens has also been involved with the FDA's Case for Quality program. As some of you may know, this is the program that seeks to go beyond just compliance and focus on, as the FDA says, critical to quality practices that result in higher quality outcomes. And Siemens has been a member of the ASME VNP40 since 2012 with the goal of helping answer the question, how can simulation help me as a device developer to accelerate the regulatory process? And there are, of course, many publicly accessible documents uh, that outline these efforts, documents from FDA, ASME, and others. So in this webinar, we'll be focusing on the use of simulation for predicting product performance, and that is verification. But of course, verification is just one stage of the medical device development cycle. The cycle usually begins with, or begins with the requirements definition, and then planning your verification strategy, followed by actually conducting the verification activities, which may include analysis and simulation, which has the benefits that you see listed there, relatively cheap, quick, and can be done early in the design process. And then of course, you have your animal and human trials, which have the characteristics that you see listed there, the expense, the relatively limited observability, and the fact that they occur relatively late into the design cycle, using a device that's practically the one that you're going to bring to market and to your regulatory agency. Oh, by the way, for those of you wondering what the video is showing, it's the uh, surgical procedure to clip off a brain aneurysm. So hopefully it's, uh, it's not lunchtime anywhere. But anyway, all this data you're gathering by all these methods, simulation, testing, all this evidence of device performance, will of course go into your design history file and become part of your regulatory filing. In other words, you will need it for compliance reporting as well as for your own quality system. Now, the goal is to have processes and tools in place that provide traceability from requirements to engineering data. The Siemens portfolio does include solutions for each of these phases, but for this webinar, we'll be focusing on the analysis portion and specifically simulation. Now, one of the things that simulation is particularly well suited to is getting a handle on the effects of variability on device performance. Now, there are many sources of variability, and as a device developer, part of your job is to assess and account for the effects of variability from all these different sources on the performance of your device. So you have dimensional variability. There we go. And, and this is the, part of the kind of variability where, as part of your design process, you optimize the dimensions of key device characteristics to meet your objectives. In the case of the example shown here, simulation was actually used to design a syringe mechanism to maximize disengagement force to prevent reuse of the device while minimizing the engagement force for ease of use and drug dosage accuracy. But you also have operational variability. And this is how a device performs under different use conditions. And in the example shown here, a surgical robot was designed to operate within a defined operating envelope. And yet in practice, it was observed that the clinicians using the device would actually use it in ways and situations in which the manufacturer could not warrant the safety and stability of the setup. And so simulation can be used in this scenario as well to simulate device response across different ranges of use, including in off design scenarios. Of course, I should mention that you know, operational variability is one of the reasons that human factors testing is conducted and in fact is required as part of your regulatory filing to make sure that you've accounted for the ways that the end users will actually operate the device. And then of course you have patient variability. Uh, this example here shows a situation where you're simulating an implanted device like a, a catheter, a heart valve, or a stent. And you must of course account for the downstream hemodynamics in the simulation model. So simulation can be used to tune the parameters for things like inertia and resistance to the blood flow as a result of the fact that downstream of the device, there are organs and blood vessel bifurcations, this type of thing. So simulation can be used to perform the tuning mathematically against experiments to make sure that your simulation is using the right boundary conditions. And in the case we'll be discussing in this webinar, computational fluid dynamics simulation is used to assess the performance of, the, of a device when it's placed within a range of individual anatomies, just as you would in a 
clinical trial. So we'll be focusing in this webinar on patient variability. We've chosen an illustrative example for the purposes of putting all these ideas in a more concrete form. Specifically, we'll be looking at predicting the performance of a hemodialysis catheter using CFT. So these are catheters that are inserted into the superior vena cava, the main vein entering the heart, for the purposes, of course, of filtering the blood to remove waste when a patient's kidneys are non-functional. These catheters have two sides, or lumens as they're called, the arterial side, which takes blood from the vena cava to a dialysis machine for filtering, and then the venous side, which then returns the clean blood from the dialysis machine to the vena cava. The procedure, the procedure is a, a critical one, but as you can see on the slide, it's, it's fairly time consuming. And it's also a case where hemodynamics plays an essential role in how the catheter performs. Now, in an earlier webinar that we conducted about a year ago, we discussed the simulation and design exploration that was performed on just such a hemodialysis catheter. In that case, we were looking at dimensional variability, determining the designs that worked best. But what do we mean by works best when it comes to catheters? Well, as you can see in the slide, catheter use is, is not without risk. They are known to be susceptible to thrombosis, the formation of blood clots, as well as hemolysis, the rupturing of red blood cells. And both of these contribute to the occurrence of uh, vascular access morbidity, uh, with as many as 25% of the catheters resulting in at least a partial thrombosis. In addition, catheters must be designed or shown to operate with a minimum of blood recirculation. That is, you wanna prevent newly dialyzed blood being returned to the dialysis machine prior to actually circulating through the body. So today we'll be looking at simulations of this optimized catheter design placed within a range of virtual patients, each with slightly different anatomies, just as it would be in real life, to look at how the catheter performs in the environment in which it is meant to be used. In other words, we'll be looking at simulations to account for patient variability, but we'll also illustrate how simulation can be used to assess operational variability. You know, these catheters aren't always placed in exactly the same spot in each patient, so simulation can be used to see how the performance of the catheter is affected by changes in positioning on each of these individual virtual patients. So I've mentioned the term virtual patients a number of times now, so it's a good time to turn it over to Julian, who will discuss how Materialize develops them. So over to you, Julian. Thanks a lot to Siemens for the opportunity to present some of our work here. Um, so as Javier said, I'll be covering the part of uh, the creation of virtual patients, so um, the anatomical input uh, for this study, which was provided by Materialize. And I want to talk, uh, I will start by talking about uh, anatomy a little bit. Um, so here we are looking at a few potential patients, and you can see that they have vastly different anatomies. Uh, and it, it is a big challenge to design medical devices that will perform equally well and safely for all of these different patients on this bell curve. Um, R&D teams need to have a very thorough understanding of the target anatomy and how it varies in that patient population. Anatomy has a very significant impact on, on many levels, um, safety, performance, but also usability, logistics, regulatory aspects, etc. cetera. The degree to which R&D teams are able to understand the anatomy, to know all of these patients, or at least have an idea of who all of these patients are, um, and, and how their anatomy interacts with a particular device, uh, is a key success factor for, for many medical devices, I would say most of them. Um, but so how do engineers make sure that they have that thorough understanding of the anatomy? Traditionally, as Javier discussed as well, this would be done through cadaver studies, animal studies, um, and then ultimately clinical trials. And I'll be echoing uh, a lot of what Javier ha has shown uh, in, in his presentation here, but there's more and more attention for alternatives to these traditional methods. Uh, this table, I think, shows a really nice example uh, of the benefits of computer models. Of course, they have some strong limitations, right, compared to real-life animals and, and definitely clinical trials, but they also have clear advantages. They allow more control, they are cheaper, they are faster, etc. So while co computational modeling will never completely replace these existing methods, uh, it can be very complementary. I think they fill a really important gap between animal trials and clinical trials. The 
the reason why we do animal tests is, of course, because yeah, it's too risky to go straight to human trials. But animals then have yeah the very obvious and very real limitation that their anatomy is significantly different uh, from humans. And I believe computational modeling gives something that sort of combines the best of these two worlds. You can hu use accurate human anatomy, but at the same time be risk-free. Uh, and that's why we like to use that term, virtual patients. You know, rather than testing devices on animals, which have non-human anatomy, or human patients, which is too risky, why not test them on these virtual patients? And I want to um, talk a little bit about that because I know it's a, a kind of a buzzword. So how do we define uh, virtual patients? There are many different different definitions uh, that I try to summarize a little bit, like this. Um, a, a virtual patient is a computer model of a patient which can reliably predict the response of this patient to a certain treatment. This is a very broad definition. Uh, it covers many different types of models. There are very simple virtual patients, very complex ones. There are many different applications as well. People use the term virtual patients in this context, an R&D context in silico clinical trials but also in the context of physician training or patient-specific planning. And I think this definition sort of fits all of these types and all of these applications. In this case, we are talking about 3D virtual patients. What do I mean by that? These are patients that we extracted from, in this case, CT scans. So we took CT scans of these patients. We segmented out the anatomy of interest, uh, in, this, in this case, the superior vena cava and then converted that uh, to a triangular surface mesh. Um, in this context, that's the basic step to create that virtual patients. Now, how many of these do we need? How many virtual patients should we use to, to get results that are representative of the population? How big a sample uh, will give us an indication of whether or not our device will indeed perform equally well for all the different patients uh, we saw earlier on the bell curve. It's probably quite a few, uh, at least dozens or, or even hundreds. Now, as Javier discussed as well, there's quite a lot of variability to deal with here, right? Let's say you want to uh, test a, a few device designs and you want to, um, you know, the operational variability here would be different positions of the device in the anatomy. That's already quite a few um, simulations to run even before considering any patient variability. So if you add that a whole lot of patients, well, I think that's uh, enough to, to give some engineers a heart attack. So with the current computational power, realistically, we should probably restrict it to a handful of patients. But then, you know, to get back to the bell curve, you know, you don't want to just pick a random patient either. You know, what if it's this guy or, or even this lady? How representative are they of the population? Probably not that much. They have very anecdotal, uh, so they're very anecdotal examples. They, they have very specific features that are specific to them and not general to the population. And that's why I would like to uh, introduce two types, actually, of 3D virtual patients. One is the type that we discussed earlier, so you have CT scans and you extract these 3D anatomies from them. Let's, uh, and those are based on, on specific patients, right? So let's call those specific virtual patients. Now, if you have a, a reasonable number of those specific virtual patients, you can use methods like statistical shape modeling, for instance, to create what we call synthetic or derived virtual patients. Um, so these are derived from the, the real anatomies. They are not in our patient data sets, but they are realistic um, shapes of the anatomy that patients could have. Um, and that, that brings a, a number of advantages. Um, so, of course, if you can create your own patients, if you will, well, you can create very extreme uh, virtual patients. You can really try to create your, vir your worst case virtual patients. And at the same time, these synthetic virtual patients are less anecdotal uh, uh, than the specific virtual patients, so they, they are more representative. And this ability to um, produce real, true 
edge cases, uh, let's say, that are at the same time general enough to be representative of the entire population, that's something that could give, should give more confidence to test on only a limited number of virtual patients. Um, it's also a unique capability of virtual patients, right? You cannot, you cannot like Frankenstein, create your own real patient, uh, but you can, uh, you know, create these virtual patients um, as opposed to animals, cadavers, uh, or real patients. Um, so you'll see in Aaron's presentation that the synthetic virtual patients that we used here, they give more extreme results uh, than the specific ones. Um, and at the same time, the specific virtual patients, they can create really surprising results, with which, uh, you know, thanks to the synthetic patients, we can see some of these are not necessarily representative for the population as a whole. Um, and actually, we've presented a, a study uh, at last year's Frontiers in Medical Devices conference uh, to quantify the fact that that's what I just said, that the, the synthetic virtual patients are more representative. Um, I won't go too much in detail on, on this study, but it was on uh, 40 patients uh, on the right heart, and we picked um, three reference shapes, so three specific patients, small, medium, and large, as reference shapes. And then we also created three synthetic reference shapes. Um, and as you can see uh, on, the, on the left, uh, the, the box plot there, um, the synthetic reference shapes were closer to those 40 patients uh, in the data set uh, than the specific ones. You can kind of see the same results on the right side uh, with those color plots uh, that, sh that show more in detail the mean local deviations uh, in the different areas of the right heart. Um, so that's yeah how we showed in a quantitative way how the synthetic virtual patients are indeed less anecdotal and more representative of the population than uh, specific uh, virtual patients. So before I get to um, the work that we did here, uh, I just want to give a quick overview of how we typically uh, use these um, virtual patients in R&D context. Uh, so, you know, in the best case, you have a pretty good library of, of 3D patients uh, so, uh, to start with. And then what can you do with these? You can get design input. Um, so you can go and form all kinds of measurements on your database uh, of virtual patients to get an idea of how they vary in the population. Statistical shape model uh, modeling can be a good tool as well. And then more what we're discussing today, you can do virtual testing. So here today we're talking about simulation. Uh, you can also do just virtual implantation. So implant your device uh, or the CAT file of your device in a virtual patient and somehow measure the outcome. Uh, this is less advanced, of course, than the simulation, but since it's less computationally expensive as well, it, it allows you to test on, uh, on, more, uh, on more patients. And then, uh, you know, to bring back those virtual patients to the material world, uh, you can 3D print them, uh, and this is uh, commonly used uh, for anatomical bench testing. Okay, so let's look a little bit at what we did uh, in, in this study. So we had an input data set of 30 cardiac angio CT scans. Uh, and we started by measuring uh, how much of the superior vena cava was present uh, in those scans. And we decided to use a cutoff of 40 millimeters, uh, which meant that we had to discard 10 of the patients, uh, and that, that left us with 20 patients. Um, a bit of information about the, the data set, so one of, one of the patients we didn't have any info about, but the remaining ones, there were eight female and 11 male patients, and their ages ranged uh, from 44 to 87, with a mean of 71 and a standard deviation of 13. Uh, so you can see that it's kind of skewed towards the, the older patients here. Um, so we took those CT scans, we converted them to those uh, 3D virtual patients, as we saw earlier, um, which left us with 20 uh, specific virtual patients. We then created a statistical shape model uh, based on these 20 patients. 
Uh, and from that, from the first mode of variation, which is the main geometric variation uh, that's, that is shown by the statistical shape model, we created these three synthetic virtual patients, the 1 percentile, 50, and 99 percentile virtual patients. We then also used that same statistical shape model to pick three uh, specific virtual patients, uh, the smallest, medium, and large, again, according to the first mode of variation of the SSM. The advantage of using the SSM to select these uh, virtual patients is that we don't need to pick, uh, you know, some kind of arbitrary measurement of a diameter in a specific location or, or anything like that. Uh, it's really based on the, the, the shape as a whole and the overall size of the model. And then the last step we did on our side was to fill the inlets and outlets uh, of, of these files, and then we gave them a nice uniform surface mesh, and um, that's when we sent uh, these files over to Siemens. So uh, this is where I give the floor, the virtual floor that is to Aaron. Okay, so um, I'm going to spend just a minute kind of tying together a little bit of what Javier and what Julian have presented, and then uh, most of my time will be spent giving a demonstration of how some of this is actually set up particularly the automation side of things. So as background, the catheter design process, uh, one thing that we're interested in is reducing the likelihood of a thrombosis. Uh, <clears throat> the blood clotting cascade is very um, complicated and it's not something that we have a great handle on from a modeling perspective at this point, but we can uh, say a few things about the hemodynamics of a certain blood flow and how likely it is to cause thrombosis. We know that these are very strongly associated with dead zones or separating, recirculating flows within the, uh, within the catheter or in the vein itself. And the, uh, a much more detailed description of the modeling of this is given about a year ago, but I, do, I just want to some just a little re brief reminder of what it is we're looking at in the simulation. We're watching for these kind of separated recirculating zones, and the volumetric percentage of the domain that is occupied by that type of flow is our quantitative measure of how likely a thrombosis is. Obviously, we're also uh, interested in understanding the effect of the catheter on the uh, likelihood of hemolysis. Uh, we have a, a model that we take from a um, scientific publication on the topic and impl implemented that in star CCM Plus. It allows us to, um, to simulate the modified index of hemolysis. The higher the index, the uh, more hemolysis uh, has occurred. And then finally, uh, we have blood that is entering the body through one of the lumens in the catheter and leaving uh, on the other, and we want to minimize the amount that's sort of just instantaneously recirculating into and out of the body. Um, and we do that by tagging all of the flow that's being returned to the body with a numerical passive scalar and uh, then detecting what portion of that is is leaving through the uh, the exit. So um, with those with that background, uh, then you are excuse me, Javier has introduced you to the fact that we did an optimization study and we kind of identified um, some high performing catheter designs. And what we did is and this is very common is you'll rarely find that there's only one uh, interesting solution to these problems. In this case, we found a lot of clustering of designs around a, des around a, um, a catheter that had kind of a very novel design. It was completely unlike anything that we had seen in literature to that point. It certainly wasn't representative of any sort of catheter that we uh, were aware of on the market. And then we also found several high-performing designs that actually mimicked a lot of the sort of traditional design characteristics. And um, 
a really interesting thing that we wanted to expand on after doing this optimization is is understanding you know um, what performance distinctions can be made between these two kinds of catheters we we have the optimization results they perform very similarly to each other but um, are they for example both uh, do they have the same sensitivity to the various kinds of anatomies that they might encounter in the field or um, another thing that we we read in the literature that's important to consider is the fact that these catheters are, are not something that uh, uh, can be reliably um, placed by a clinician uh, in exactly the same kind of position and orientation every time. I mean, obviously the anatomy is different, but even if we had identical anatomy, they're going to go in a different orientation, slightly different positions. And it's important to understand, uh, is there any sensitive sensitivity to those parameters? Now, one thing that we chose to do in the optimization, because we were interested to see if it resulted in any novel design concepts, is we allowed the uh, venous and arterial lumens to be designed independently from each other. And this is a pretty significant departure from anything that we found on the market. These are all designed um, to be symmetric, where the venous and arterial lumens have essentially the same design, just mirror image of each other. And um, the reason why we allowed it to be asymmetric is because we just wanted to look at from a performance standpoint, is there anything uh, interesting that we can generate in terms of the reduced risk of thrombosis or separation, things like that? Um, it may very well be in the field that there are perhaps manufacturing considerations that require it to be symmetric, and that's and that's perfectly fine. The point was just to look at from a performance perspective. Is there a compelling argument to try and you know reduce those limitations uh, if they exist? So, at the end of the day, uh, what we wanted to do was look at basically three catheter designs, uh, our sort of novel design concept that came out of the optimization the more or less traditional design concept that had just been slightly, you know, tuned to better performance and also taking that same traditional um, catheter and creating a, a symmetric version of it and, and doing the same sensitivity comparisons between the symmetric and the asymmetric models. So here we have a study that I should say the first study that we were interested in is looking at sensitivity to anatomy. And we took the six anatomies that uh, Julian provided us, three of them that were patient specific, and three of them that were statistical ensembles um, <clears throat> of the, uh, the patients, the group of patients in their sample pool. And we ran each of the catheters through all six of these anatomies. Then beyond that, what we said is let's take uh, each catheter, we'll choose one of the anatomies, and we, we decided to choose one of the statistical ensemble anatomies, and we will uh, modify uh, stochastically uh, through random variation the position and orientation of the catheter in this vein and look at how sensitive, you know, the a modified index of hemolysis the separation and the recirculation are. So with that background, uh, I think we're ready to kind of dive into the demonstration here. I'm gonna bring up SimCenter, Star CCM Plus, and really anything that you're gonna do inside of SimCenter, Star CCM Plus, is going to start with a simulation. Now, as far as the demonstration is concerned, our presentation about a year ago is where I spent time discussing the workflow uh, and how we put together a simulation. So we are not going to spend time on this uh, demonstration with that, other than to say that we have here a kind of pipeline that allows us to bring in a new anatomy uh, and basically recreate the CFD domain and automatically generate a volume mesh for doing the hemodynamic simulations. 
This workflow is parametric, meaning that I have a list of all of the CAD parameters associated with the catheter itself, as well as the parameters associated with positioning and orientation of the catheter in the vein. So now what I have more or less is, is really a template simulation that can be used as sort of the launching pad to consider all of these many different variations that I'm interested in understanding uh, the sensitivity implications of. So uh, from there, uh, what we would do is go into Design Manager. And uh, Design Manager is basically uh, an automation tool uh, within the Sim Center Star CCM Plus portfolio. You can uh, read in a reference simulation, and what you do is you get a sort of compressed list of all of the aspects or characteristics of that simulation that are relevant to a design exploration study, whether it's optimization or, or sensitivity. So here I see the full list of parameters. I also have all the post-processing. So the reports, what is my modified index of hemolysis? What is the recirculation? What is the separation? And, and obviously any other values that I'm tracking where I'm interested in. And then the post-processing, what are the plots? What are the scenes that I, I wanna look at? So now I can create a new design study. And um, in this case, what I wanna do is make a, do a manual design study where uh, I'm going to run through those 18 simulations, well, all three catheters through each of the six anatomies. So I need to choose my input parameters. Uh, I like to try and make things easy on myself. So I, anything that I know I might wanna use as a parameter, I prepend it with a, a P underscore, which makes it easy to find. And then I have a design table that I can populate. Now I could just one by one by one add in the designs and manually type in the uh, values of each of the parameters. Alternatively, and what's typically a lot more efficient, is I can import a CSV file that can be generated any number of ways. I prefer to use Excel in this case. It allows me to very quickly put together uh, the table. And now I have all my 18 designs. I have the correct values for all of my parameters. And basically now the, the manual design study is ready to run. It knows what designs to run, and it knows how to create the simulation for every single one of those designs. I'm gonna, add, it's, I'm gonna tell it what are the values I want to track, and uh, we'll just, for the purposes of the demonstration, we'll just take the three that are directly relevant to the performance of the catheter. Uh, for the scenes, I typically just go ahead and grab all of them. You have the option of choosing a Simpson or Star CCM Plus viewer file, which is a 3D, 3D viewer, or a hard copy, which is a PNG. Um, and you'll see in a moment what the advantages of the, the 3D uh, viewer files are. And finally, we're just going to do the same thing with any of the plots in the simulation. A few runtime settings, for example, how many simultaneous jobs do I want to run? I think uh, in this case, I chose to run six of them at a time on 32 cores each. I have the ability to run it on a Linux cluster, or Windows cluster, direct, which really just means locally on a workstation. So um, in this case, these are all run on the high, perform high performance computing Linux cluster. And then the study is ready to run. Now, um, I could certainly run it right now. However, I can actually set up my stochastic studies right away. Just copy and paste uh, my study and change it from manual to stochastic. Now, uh, I don't need all of the parameters uh, in this case. The ones that are associated with the catheter um, design are not necessary. The stochastic study is only looking at the orientation and the position of the catheter itself within the vein. And I have a few different ways that I can uh, define the possible variation. We do it based on probability distribution functions. We support three different types, a normal or Gaussian, 
a triangular, which I've also seen referred to as a chapeau, and uh, a uniform, so equal probability across the entire range of possible values. Uh, we chose to do a normal, uh, but this is uh, very often something that requires uh, industry specific insight to set up correctly. Uh, the mean is taken as the baseline value, and then the standard deviation can be defined either as a relative value of the baseline or the mean or an absolute one. And uh, I think in this case, we just ran with about 10% uh, relative to the baseline value. So that study is ready to run as well. And because I copied and pasted it from the earlier one, all my other run settings are already set. I could now submit this in batch. It would run through both of these studies on the cluster and, and generate all the information for me, obviously. That would take more time than we can demonstrate live, but I do have a simulation where we have some of the, uh, the results already. So we have our manual study uh, and then the three stochastic studies. Now, for the first uh, little bit, I want to focus in on the manual study and, and kind of show through some post-processing what did we learn about the sensitivities there. You can see the results here for all 18 of the simulations. Uh, I ran them in order of uh, each catheter running through all of the anatomy. So designs one through six are all um, the traditional catheter the optimized traditional catheter through each of the six anatomies. It's going to be useful for post-processing to create a new design set. We'll just call it test one. And I want to do that for each of the three different catheters. This is going to allow me to break these designs apart from each other in the other plots that I'm going to look at for post-processing and make interesting comparisons between the three different catheter designs. And I want to create a new uh, XY plot. And I'm going to add a new data series from my manual study. And I'm going to say, instead of choosing the all designs design set, I'm just going to look at that test one. And I can even give the traditional, uh, assign it the traditional name in the legend. The bottom axis, I'm going to change from design number to being a parameter, and I'm going to choose the anatomy index parameter. And then on the left axis, let's just go ahead and look at the modified index of hemolysis. Okay, now uh, I'm going to apply some of my uh, Default plot options that I like to have saves me a few clicks um, getting where I, I want to be. I also like to have something that's a little bit easier to see. And we're going to go ahead and connect these with a line. So this is how the modified index of hemolysis changed for the traditional catheter design between the various anatomies. What we really want to do is we want to compare that to the other two catheter designs. And we can easily copy and paste data simply by dragging and dropping it in the tree. So now instead of looking at test one, we'll look at test two. We'll modify the color. And then we'll go to the next one. And what we'll say also is we'll call this the novel design. We will change this to test three and call this the traditional symmetric catheter. And we will also change the color something a little bit easier to see. So now we can start to get an understanding. Well, we first see that the trend across all of the designs, uh, all the catheters is very similar. As we go from uh, um, one, two, and three are the patient-specific anatomies, four, five, and six are the statistical ensembles. And we see that as we go from smaller to larger anatomies, we generally see an in increase in the index 
the modified index of hemolysis. We see that the, uh, for all anatomies, both of the optimized designs perform very, very similarly to each other. Uh, this was to be expected uh, based on the optimization results because the performance of these two designs, particularly with regards to modified index of hemolysis, was nearly identical. And what we see here is that is not dependent on any specific anatomy. We can expect that across a wide range of anatomies. Interestingly enough, we do see that forcing the traditional design to be symmetric uh, actually results in a modest improvement in the modified index of hemolysis. So that's interesting, and that could certainly inform and, and will inform any future optimization work that we did. We might actually force the algorithm to explore symmetric designs, either exclusively or just more than it was in the previous optimization study. Now, uh, this only gives us a picture of one of the performance metrics. But I want to go ahead and for the uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to look at, instead of recreating these plots for you, uh, since you've kind of seen what that process looks like, we're going to do work with some that I've already created. So looking at recirculation, this one was very interesting. First of all, the trend in terms of which catheter design performed best, and, and best here means the lowest recirculation value, actually uh, changes. So as you go from the uh, smallest to the larger anatomies, uh, one or the other of the designs might actually perform better. Most interesting, though, is to see that this symmetric design was highly, highly sensitive to one of these anatomies. And um, any any type of extreme sensitivity to a specific condition would be concerning, but especially a sensitivity that decreases performance. Uh, is something that uh, is very important to be aware of and would uh, be a pretty significant uh, negative point against uh, the symmetric design in this case. Um, the, uh, the other designs, they do have some sensitivity to the anatomy. The novel design, slightly more sensitivity than the traditional design, but for the most part, you get very, very consistent performance across all anatomies. Now, looking at the separation, which is, again, this is our proxy for uh, risk of thrombosis. What we see here is that the traditional and the symmetric traditional uh, behave very similarly, a small delta between them, and uh, definitely some some sensitivity to anatomy here. Kind of an, an interesting trend that with the patient-specific anatomies, we more or less see an increasing trend. It is minor and I don't think would represent a significant concern uh, as you go from small to large anatomies. But as you go from small to large ensemble anatomies, you get the opposite trend and it is more pronounced. Um, and then this is really what made the novel catheter design so compelling from the optimization study is that it had significantly lower uh, total separation of the flow. And uh, what we see here is that is not really uh, relative to a specific anatomy or operating condition. That is something that is consistent across uh, all of the anatomies that were explored and represents a, a really compelling argument for why a design, uh, this design should be considered uh, if you were getting ready to make a final design decision. So this type of information we find to be uh, critical to making truly informed uh, design choices, especially as you get down to the final um, product uh, design choices that you have before uh, you go into manufacturing. So obviously those 18 simulations provided us with a lot of information. We gained a lot of insight into the sensitivity of these catheters to the various types of anatomies they could encounter. But let's, let's look at what we generated with uh, regards to the, um, the stochastic uh, studies. Now in these cases, uh, to get statistics that are meaningful, you have to run a much larger number of evaluations. In this case, 
we're varying five parameters and we ran 300 different simulations. Now, um, there are histogram type plots that are a little bit more uh, useful for exploring this data. Those are not currently in the design manager utility itself, but it is packaged with Heeds Post, which is a post processing tool for our Heeds MDO software, which is our general purpose design exploration package. So I can automatically import all of those results. What I want to do is look at a probability distribution function, for example, for the modified index of hemolysis. And what this does is it gives me a histogram and then it does a best fit for a Gaussian distribution and I can see some of the statistics, what's the mean, what's the standard deviation. And at the end of the day, most of the time those are the characters, that, that's the metrics that you're looking at when you're comparing different designs uh, from a stochastic standpoint. What's the mean? Is there a statistically significant difference in the mean between these two different designs? And what's the standard deviation? What's the expected variability of my response in the real world? In this case, we're saying it due to real world um, uncertainties in the position and orientation of the catheter. And to just kind of close things up, I'll hop back into the PowerPoint where I have combined some of this data. So. We ran this study for all three of the catheter designs, the novel, the traditional, and the symmetric one. And here we can see that the means for the modified index of hemolysis and the standard deviations are all very, very similar. There really isn't a distinction that we can make between these designs here. This is the standard deviation represented as a percentage of the mean, which is often a useful metric to look at. Here we're looking at separation. And instantly we see that um, as we modify in 300 different ways the possible positions of these catheters, that performance improvement of the novel uh, catheter design is, is significant. So looking at the uh, standard deviation to the mean, we can basically assert that in 99.99% .99 of these cases, for any possible positioning of a catheter, the novel design is going to have significantly better performance. And we knew that in these specific orientations where we had done our manual study, that was likely to be the case. But now we have a much more robust uh, data set that shows us that this is not only true under these specific circumstances, but statistically valid across basically the entire range of expected operating conditions. And now we're looking here at the uh, percent recirculation. Uh, we see a little bit more variability here. And I think this is um, this was hinted at by the results that we saw in the manual study where the trend and the behavior of which catheter performed better uh, was highly dependent on the anatomy. And we see a little bit of that sensitivity here too for positioning in a given anatomy. Um, but there's still not a truly dramatic difference. There would, uh, if we were to look at the percentage overlap of uh, recirculation percent across these different designs, there would be a lot of overlap. Um, and so in many cases, these are statistically um, very similar to each other with respect to recirculation. So um, that is the, uh, that completes the demonstration and and discussion of our uh, simulation results. Uh, I think that uh, one thing that was really exciting for us was to get the chance to see the, the depth and richness of information that you can uh, acquire when you leverage things like the powerful uh, anatomical models that we were able to receive uh, from Julian uh, with these statistical and uh, traditional design of experiment techniques. So. With that, uh, I'll conclude. This officially concludes today's webinar. Thanks again for joining us, everyone, and have a great day.